Showing up this morning, blesses this old pastor's heart to see you here. Um, welcome, my name is Troy, I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, we're just grateful that you uh, joined us on this Easter weekend. And so, um, ah, here's the thing, I want to talk to you about this. As we, uh, I'm going to just jump right in this. As we have gathered here today to celebrate Easter, what I want to do this morning is I want to invite you to go back in time with me to uh, the day just before that very first Easter. I mean, before the original Easter, right? Before anyone imagined such a thing could even happen. All right, I want to go back to that. And and my reason for taking you back to that particular moment is that I think it is the most compelling reason for why you should consider following Jesus. Or why maybe you should reconsider following Jesus. If, you know, once you grew up, you kind of, you know, gave up. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, maybe Easter and Christmas are the only time you kind of uh, come into church. Uh, and I get it. By the way, listen, I'm not, I'm not giving you a rough time about this. Uh, if I heard your story about why you may have gave up on this um, when you grew up, I would probably respond to you uh, with, with a simple statement. I would say, who could blame you? I would say, who would blame you, right? I mean, if that had happened to me, uh, or if I experienced what you experienced, if, if uh, church people had treated me the way they treated you, um, I would have left too. <laughs> I got out of that. And, or if that's how the Bible was used or abused, uh, you know, when, in your church when you were growing up, um, I, don't, I don't really blame you for walking away. I really don't. Um, I mean, unfortunately, we know this is true. Uh, sometimes uh, bad Christians happen to good people. You ever heard that? That'd make a good bumper sticker, right? Uh, and it just leaves a bad taste in our mouth. And so I, I get that that happens. Or maybe you just got tired of hearing the Bible says, you know, the Bible says, the Bible says. And when you grew up, you read uh, what the Bi- other parts of what the Bible says, and you just decided, I don't buy it anymore. So I get it. I understand. Like I said, if I heard your story, um, I would probably say, who could blame you? But... For just the next few moments here, um, I want to take you back in time to a time before there were any Christians, before there were any churches, and before there were any Bibles even, um, to a time when there was just a few uh, dozen men and women who kind of found themselves wrestling with some of the same feelings that maybe you're feeling this morning, feelings of mistrust or distrust or maybe even disgust about your misplaced faith. I get it. And so, can we do that together? Is that all right? I promise it'll be worth it. Uh, So, here I'm going to jump into this. I want to go back to this spot on the afternoon just after Jesus was crucified, just after he died. This would have been Friday evening. Um, And history tells us that two well-respected men, a guy by the name of Joseph of Arimathea and a guy by the name of Nicodemus, both of these were Jewish men, uh, Pharisees, and they went to uh, Pontius Pilate. Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea at the time, and they went to him and they asked him for permission to be able to take um, Jesus' dead body down off of the cross. Now, crucified people were usually left there to rot. I mean, that's just how it was. You need to understand that the goal of crucifixion um, wasn't just death. Uh, There were much quicker and easier ways to kill a person. The goal of crucifixion uh, was more specific. The goal of crucifixion was oblivion, was to make it as if that person had never lived at all, that they ever existed at all, um, that they would be gone and wiped out without a trace. Uh, There would be no grave. There'd be no grave markers. There'd be no place for people to come and remember them. And so the bodies that were on crosses or what was left of the bodies would often at some point be taken down and then loaded into some cart and then put in a dump somewhere where animals would probably end up consuming them. But for the right price, um, uh, occasionally the remains of of, of a crucified body could be bought. And so these two prominent men uh, uh, risked their reputations uh, to buy Jesus' body. Now, just so you know, real quick, um, we don't know that that happened. We don't know that this happened because the Bible says so. We don't, that, it's, no, no, no. The Bible didn't even exist until hundreds of years later. We know that this happened because uh, some guys, a guy by the name of Matthew, um, uh, a guy by the name of Peter, uh, another guy by the name of John, and then a doctor, a physician named Luke, we know because they told us so. 
There were three eyewitnesses here, three first-hand eyewitnesses, and a physician who kind of turned into a private eye. They're the ones that told us this happened. Now, yes, it's true. These guys wrote down their accounts, and many, many years later, uh, their testimonies were included in a collection of ancient documents, which we now call the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, okay? So that's how it happened, and, and that's a story for another day, okay? So let's back to this. After pulling the body down, these two men quickly prepared it for burial according to Jewish custom. And uh, then they placed it in a cave that had been kind of cleared out and carved out to serve as a tomb. And, and then they sealed it up with a big old stone, a large stone. And, uh, and I just want to be very clear real quick why they were doing this. Joseph and uh, Nicodemus had secretly hoped that Jesus was who he claimed to be. Um, but it was obvious now he was not. He was not the Messiah. That dream was clearly over. Uh, but in their opinion, they, they felt that Jesus had been tried and executed unjustly and unfairly and that he, deserved, he didn't deserve the fate of a common criminal. And so the least that they could do was to ensure that he had a proper burial. And so they placed him in a tomb and they sealed it up with a stone and then they went home uh, before the Passover would start, which is when the sun would go down. Now... Meanwhile, at this very point, when these guys are doing this, 1,500 miles away in the city of Rome, uh, the Roman emperor at that time was a fellow by the name of Tiberius Caesar. Tiberius is in this palace, and on this moment, he has no idea what just happened in Jerusalem. No earthly idea. He didn't, hear, he didn't know that some guys got crucified. Had no idea. In fact, that wouldn't have been big news. People were getting crucified all the time all over the Roman Empire. So he wouldn't have known about that. And as far as uh, he was concerned, Judea was basically the armpit of the Roman Empire. It's like this backwater place and that nothing, nothing significant ever happened there. Nothing important. And then at this time, also at the same time, 600 miles away, north, uh, in a city called Tarsus, um, a Pharisee by the name of Saul, who would later jump onto the pages of history known as Paul, he was a Jewish Pharisee. He was just preparing to have Passover with his Jewish buddies. He had no idea that this happened. And at this same exact time, about 20 miles away from Jerusalem, a guy by the name of Thomas, who uh, would soon earn an unfortunate nickname, he was running from the city. He was running for his life. He was hiding for his life. Uh, uh, some of his other uh, buddies, the disciples, many of them, uh, you know, Peter and John and Matthew, those guys had kind of hung out in the city. They were at a house somewhere behind locked doors, and they were together, and they were trying to figure out what next to do with their lives now that Jesus had totally let them down. They're like, this is three years, and it's over. What, what do we do now? Uh, I mean, Matthew was thinking, gosh, I, I, can't, I can't go back to being a tax collector now. That, those days are over. Uh, uh, Peter was thinking, well, maybe I could go back up to Galilee and I could start up my fishing business again, um, but maybe not. And then uh, John, John at this point was just thinking, gosh, man, I just got to figure out how to reorganize my house so that Jesus' mother Mary can move in with us now that I'm in charge of her. And speaking of Mary, by the way, uh, Mary and other women that kind of were part of this, Mary Magdalene, they were huddled together also somewhere in Jerusalem in a house. And man, as you can imagine, they were brokenhearted. In fact, Mary was in complete shock at what she had just witnessed done to her son. I mean, she, she couldn't even begin to think about what was next or what she would do. And so here's my point. Um, get this. You may have never thought about this. On the evening just after the crucifixion, you could have found some confused citizens and you could have found some frightened disciples and you could have found some uh, heartbroken women. But the one thing that you would not have been able to find on the day before the first Easter were any Christians. There were no Christians at all. There were no believers and there were certainly no Jesus followers whatsoever. Nobody believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Nobody believed that he was the son of God. Um, and he certainly wasn't the savior because he couldn't even save himself. And so my point is, is that nobody was planning on keeping this Jesus thing, this Jesus movement alive because the Jesus movement was dead, <laughs> right? Jesus was dead and he wasn't who he claimed to be. 
And that's an important thing for you to understand. I don't know if you always, you, you get this, but um, Jesus didn't fit the typical model of a revolutionary. That wasn't his gig. Uh, most revolutionaries, as you know, they show up on the scene and they got this message that really appeals to the masses and, and, and people are attracted. And then when they die, because all revolutionaries die, um, then their followers, of course, take up their cause and uh, kind of keep, try to keep their ideas alive. Tell everybody about what they said. And history is full of those kind of examples. And you may have assumed that that's Jesus is part of that group. But here's the thing. Um, no serious historian embraces that theory. And no one who's actually read the Gospels believes that either. Um, uh, here's the thing. Uh, he was, he, what Jesus did, uh, you might assume that he was a revolutionary, but Jesus' message, very simply, wasn't a message of revolution. You would think that he was a revolutionary, but he, 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 it wasn't, his message wasn't even a popular message. I mean, uh, you, people would hear it, and it didn't appeal to anyone. People didn't like what they were hearing often. It was often the opposite. He kind of turned people off with things he said. He would say uninspiring things like this. He would say, um, pay your taxes. And he got the exact same reply. And I was like, <laughs> render under Caesar. And he would say things like, uh, oh, uh, love your neighbor and pray for your enemies. And like, mm. Right? Or he would say things like, uh, turn the other cheek. If someone hits you on this cheek, offer the other cheek so they can punch that too. Or, 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 or people, he would say things like, you know what, if someone asks you for your coat, um, you need to give them your coat, but then you also need to give them your shirt as well. Or if a Roman soldier orders you to carry his stuff a mile, you need to take it an extra mile. I mean, these guys are like, what? And worst of all, he said things like this. He said, regardless of what someone has done to you, regardless of how someone has treated you, you must forgive them. <laughs> <laughs> My point is, is that Jesus' teaching seemed impractical and often impossible to follow. And most of the time, people didn't really even understand what he was talking about. And so, Jesus, listen to me, this is true. Jesus never asked his followers to trust in his ideas, his philosophies. Um, he, instead, he asked his followers to trust in him. Yeah, um, that's, uh, and that's the second reason why his followers weren't intent on keeping this Jesus movement uh, alive. Jesus' ministry and message centered on him. It centered on what he claimed about himself. And that's what drove the religious leaders crazy, man. And in fact, that's what eventually got Jesus crucified. Jesus wasn't crucified for what he taught. He, he was crucified for who he claimed to be. That's what got him killed. He claimed an authority that only belonged to God. He claimed that he could forgive sin. He claimed to be greater than Moses, the lawgiver. He claimed to be greater than Solomon's temple. He claimed to even be greater than the scriptures. And, and he said things like, uh, I, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, anyone who believes in me will live forever. He said things like, uh, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so I'm telling you, Peter and his friends didn't choose to follow Jesus because of what he taught. Don't miss this. They chose to follow Jesus because of who he claimed to be. But apparently, uh, they were wrong. <laughs> they were wrong because now he was dead. I mean, you can't kill the Son of God. The Son of God can't die. And yet, um, Jesus died. And they saw him die, and his movement died with him. The movement died when Jesus died because Jesus was the movement. Does that make sense? So the whole Christian, Christianity thing was done. It was over. And so let me go back to this story, uh, and specifically to this moment, back to the hours just after Jesus was crucified. At this point, in this point in history, the Jewish temple was still standing. It was still rolling. Sacrifices were being made. Everything was being done. So the Jewish temple was still rolling. The Jewish leaders were still in charge. At this time, Rome was still ruling the world, man. They were still in charge. And life 
as miserable as it was for most people, just kind of went on. Jesus died, ho-hum, right? Clearly, the gods had spoken on this matter, right? Or as the Jewish leaders would say, clearly Jehovah <laughs> had, had, had spoken, right? Why? Because Jesus, the so-called uh, Messiah, the so-called miracle worker, the blasphemer, was dead. In, in, in an unprecedented series of events, think about this. The Roman Empire and the Jewish temple worked together to rid the world of this radical rabbi from Nazareth. It was over. <laughs> the, the, the dream was dead. It was over. There would be no more uprisings. There'd be no more crowds of people with palm branches. Here's our new king. That was all over. Christ, the crisis had been averted. Everything could go back to normal. In fact, Pontius Pilate packed his bags and headed for the, his palace on the coast just to get away from these Jews and the stench of the city, the city where blood and sacrifices are made. He wanted out. It was over, I'm telling you. Okay, now uh, let's fast forward from this moment to 350 years into the future to a date that is found in most of our high school history books. Uh, uh, it, it, it fast forward to February 27th uh, in the year of 380 D. This is historical fact. Some of you are like, what's so big about that date? Well, on that day, the emperor of Rome, a guy by the name of Theodosius I, signed a decree that has become known as the Edict of Thessalonica. Whew, what does that mean? Well, this is what it said. Get this. Christianity, as of today, is now the official religion of the Roman Empire. Right? Uh, all other pagan religions and, and, and customs and priests and temples and all of that junk would no longer be supported by the Roman government. From now on, just Christianity moving forward. To which when you and I hear this, we're like, wait, what? What just happened? How did that happen, right? I mean, seriously, we're thinking about it. Let me get this straight. Uh, Rome, get this. Rome crucifies the leader of a Jewish cult with the help of his own people. They helped him do it, right? And then 350 years later, uh, this same discredited Galilean carpenter is now considered a god? I mean, more than that, not just a god, the god, the one and only true god. That's kind of strange. What happened? I mean, where, how did that? I mean, the, the, Jesus, think about this. Jesus wasn't even a Roman. He never even set foot in Rome. And all of a sudden, he has replaced all of the gods of Rome. That's just weird. That's just weird. And now, uh, not only that, let's fast forward to today. From there. Today, there's no more Roman Empire. Um, uh, it rose and fell. But listen, if you go to Rome... If you go visit the city of Rome today, one of the things you'll see is that it is filled with crosses. I mean, they're everywhere you go. There are crosses all over Rome. Uh, and, and those crosses, don't make a mistake, they aren't commemorating the ancient torture device known as crucifixion. Um, they are commemorating just one single crucifixion. I mean, there were thousands of crucifixions, but all those crosses you see in Rome are there because of one single crucifixion. The Roman cross today is no longer a symbol of suffering and shame. It, is, it represents hope and salvation. And, uh, and, and stranger than that, in some ways, this is, get your mind around this, the cross represents love. What's going on here? How did history do this? I mean, if that's all you knew, if all you knew was that there was this troublemaking uh, rabbi uh, who was rejected by his own people and then he was crucified by Rome and then, uh, you know, then, then 350 years later, that same rabbi was now considered a god by the very empire that killed him. And then, flash forward 1,700 years to today, where hundreds of millions of people in almost every nation in the world now consider that man to be divine. And they gather every week to celebrate and remember him. If that's all you knew, what's the question <laughs> that's begging to be asked here? 
I mean, that series of events, what's the question that's begging to be asked? Well, let me put it this way. Let's say yesterday uh, you went to the Easter egg hunt that was downtown, and you were there, and you saw this mom, and uh, she had her little girl, and her little girl was in her nice little Easter outfit, and you said to the mom, what a, what a pretty little girl. And the mom said, thank you. Uh, and, and then she said something that was interesting. She said, you know what? We're really lucky to have her. And you went like, why? And she says, well, last year she was at our neighbor's house. She was playing on the trampoline, and she fell off the trampoline, and when she fell off the trampoline, she stopped breathing. And we couldn't figure it out. And so the paramedics came and they worked on her for about a half an hour and then they pronounced her dead. And then the mom reaches down and kind of brushes the hair out of her daughter's eyes and out of her face and then she just looks at you and she doesn't say anything. What question is begging to be asked right there? What happened? <laughs> What happened? Please uh, fill in the gap here. There's a, uh, you skipped part of the story. I mean, what happened between the moment uh, she stopped breathing and today? In the same way, when it comes to Jesus, the same exact question is begging to be asked. What happened? I mean, there's a gap here, right? Uh, something is missing. Uh, the question that we all must ask ourselves is what happened? What happened between Jesus' crucifixion and this movement, this movement that engulfed and turned up an empire upside down and eventually spread all over the world? What happened? I mean, that story doesn't make sense. Clearly, there's more to the story. Well, the truth is, the more to the story is why you and I are here this morning. That, thank you for asking, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, um, something happened. And I'm telling you, something big happened to make this happen. I mean, uh, now what is it? Well, fortunately for us, we know what happened because Matthew and uh, Mark and Peter and Luke and John, they tell us, they told us what happened. Uh, John says this. He says, early on the Sunday morning following the Passover, he said, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And it startled her, so she came running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. John is talking about himself. I'm the one. I'm the one who Jesus loved, just in case she puts that down there. Pretty interesting. And she then ran to them and she said, listen, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know, we don't know where they put him. In other words, the body isn't there. <laughs> Jesus' body wasn't there. In her mind, clearly somebody or some buddies had come and stole the body. But, so this is interesting uh, you need to understand that on that Easter morning, nobody assumed that a miracle took place or that a resurrection happened. Why? Because they all expected Jesus to do what all dead people do. Stay dead. Right? They all, I mean, every one of them saw how Jesus was killed. I mean, he was, he was filleted. I mean, his organs were exposed. Uh, and they knew there was no way possible that he was alive. Now, this is interesting. This would have been a great opportunity for these guys telling the story to uh, write themselves into the story as heroes or at least as hardcore faithfuls who never lost hope. But they don't uh, because they weren't. <laughs> In fact, Luke, who interviewed all of the disciples, he wrote this. He said, but they, after hearing this, Peter and the disciples did not believe what they were hearing from the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. I'm, I imagine some of you came in this morning going, here we go, here we go again. Let me hear this story. That, mm. And so you're not alone. Even the <laughs> first Christian said, this is nonsense. This is, no, this, is, this is crazy. This is nuts what you're telling us. Now, they were a little curious about the possibility that maybe the, the body had been stolen. And so uh, it goes on, Peter and the other disciple, again, John talking about himself, started running for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. <laughs> it's an important detail. John wants us to know that he was faster than Peter. <laughs> All of history now knows this. And, and when uh, John got there, he bent over and he looked in 
to the tomb at the strips of linen that were lying there, but he did not go in. I mean, it was a grave. I mean, he might have been faster, but he wasn't braver, right? And then, uh, and then he says that uh, Peter came along behind him, and he walked straight into the tomb. <laughs> he walked right in there, just classic Peter. And he saw the strips of linen that were lying there, as well as a cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus. It was all folded. And finally, finally, the other disciple got the courage to go in. And it says this, and in case you missed it, the other disciple who reached the tomb first... Again, you got to know that. Uh, he also went inside. Now, this next line is super powerful. Don't miss this. Um, in a way, this next line summarizes how the Christian faith really works. I don't know what you were sold when you were younger. I don't know what you were told when you were younger. But what this next line summarizes how Christian, the Christian faith actually works. Ready? He says, he saw and he believed. In other words, don't miss this. God doesn't expect us to believe everything we're told, to just swallow whatever we're told and, okay, I believe. He invites us to examine the evidence for ourselves, to look at it and study it and think about it for ourselves. He saw and then he believed. He saw that Jesus had been risen and he then realized he was who he said he was. He was who he claimed to be. And, and it verified. Later on, Jesus uh, appears to his followers that were still in the city. And then later after that, he appears to those who were returning from the city after running away, like Thomas, right? And over the next month, hundreds of people, get this, hundreds of people saw him in the flesh and it freaked them out. As you imagine, it freaked them out. So much so that they re-engaged, they began to kind of re-engage with this mission. This movement, this Jesus movement that had been going and then stopped, it started up again, but this time it spread faster and further than anyone could even begin to imagine. I mean, it spread like wildfire all over the world. And the reason these guys re-engaged wasn't because something Jesus taught. It was because of what they saw. It was something that they saw. They saw their dead friend alive again. And they couldn't help but tell everyone that they knew about what they saw and what they now believed had happened. And what had happened? Easter. Easter happened. Jesus rose from the dead. And my friend, that is the missing piece of the puzzle. That explains it. I mean, that is a missile piece. That, that's, that explains what breathed life and courage back into these disappointed, discouraged followers. They saw a dead man come back to life. I mean, what else can possibly explain uh, the explosion of Christianity all over the world? What else would make that happen? Resurrection. Uh, what you and I need to understand is that, you, now don't miss this, we need to realize that the resurrection of Jesus isn't just one of many little Bible stories. Um, the resurrection of Jesus is the story. It's the big one. It, everything flows off of that. Everything hangs off of that. According to the Apostle Paul and according to most historians, they would say that if, get this, don't miss this, if there was no resurrection, um, There'd be no story about Jesus. We wouldn't even know Jesus exists probably. He would just have faded in to history as another failed Messiah, wannabe Messiah. But Paul, by the way, Paul wrote this. Who, Paul, who hated Christians before he became one, uh, he said it best in his letter to the church in Corinth. He said this, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then even Christ has not been raised. So let's settle this issue. If there's no resurrection, Jesus wouldn't have been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And so is your time here this morning. It's just a waste of time if there is no resurrection. In other words, um, <laughs> get this, this is what he's saying. If, there wasn't, if it wasn't for a single solitary event that happened, the Christian faith would be basically a fairy tale. I mean, think about that. Everything that you and I kind of hold dear, the church and our faith and the holidays and the Bible and all that stuff, 
uh, is all of that is held together by one, according to Paul, it's all held together by one single event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why every year we, we gather together and we celebrate and remember that something happened. And what happened? Easter happened, right, you're getting it, right. Easter happened, that's what changed it. I mean, what else, again, would explain, don't miss this, what else could explain why uh, the Roman Empire embraced a crucified Jewish criminal as their God? What would make a Roman go, that's my God? I mean, that, that's weird. What else explains why a crucified uh, carpenter from Palestine is now worshipped by a third of the world's population today? The resurrection solves some of history's greatest mysteries. Um, number one, it explains why so much detail about the life of Jesus survived the first century, why we know a lot about his life. It explains why his early followers suddenly kind of regained their courage and stood up boldly and, and stood before leaders in, in the threat of death and told them what they saw. It explains why the early church was able to survive many persecutions, being thrown to the lions, being killed, being burnt at the stake, being dipped in wax and set on fire. And all they had to do is recant, recant and none of them did. It explains why, those why they were able to survive those persecutions from the temple and the, the Roman Empire. But it also uh, it solves another mystery as well, and, and that is a personal mystery. Is one that each one of us must wrestle with. It is the mystery of uh, where do we stand with God? Is there a God? And if there is, what does he want from me? The resurrection solves this. Um, here's why. The only person who ever lived and spoke with authority and certainty on that topic was Jesus of Nazareth. He was validated and he was vindicated. What do you mean by that? Why I say that? Listen to me. If someone claims to be speaking for God and then he predicts his own death and his resurrection and then he pulls it off, we should pay attention to what he says. Right? We should kind of... And here's what he said. He said, For God so loved the world, not just religious people, not just righteous people, but the whole world, that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him. Made it real easy. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, not go into oblivion, but have eternal life. That's what he said. His words, if you just believe that I raised from the dead, you could have eternal life. And here's another thing. In spite of what you may have heard from other Christians or in spite of how you've been treated by other Christians or by the church, Jesus then said this. He tacked this on at the end. He said, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. I love that. So if while I was telling this story, it kind of dawned on you that there's a possibility that this might be true? If you kind of thought, maybe. Or if maybe while I was talking about this, you realized maybe, maybe the resurrection might have actually happened. If that's you, I just want to invite you to take just that little bit of faith that you have right now and to express it to God through a prayer. Yesterday, um, I wrote a little prayer. Um, it's not from the Bible. It's just a prayer. Um, it's something that I prayed once and it changed things for me, and uh, perhaps it could change things for you, okay? Here it is. Let me, let me read it to you. Um, here's a prayer. Heavenly Father, I see now what I have missed before. I believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, and I place my trust in him as my Lord and Savior. I believe that his death paid for my sin in full and that you raised him from the dead, and I will do my best to follow him and his example for the rest of my life. That's how you feel a little bit this morning. If you kind of feel that, um, man, I want to encourage you and I want to invite you to pray that. Uh, pray it with me now, in fact. Uh, let's pray it together and then when we're done, um, I just want to pray, with, pray for you as you go. Is that okay? So let's do it. Ready? If you mean this from your heart, just say it out loud if you want. Heavenly Father, I see now what I have missed before. I believe 
that Jesus is who he claimed to be. I place my trust in him as my Lord and Savior. I believe his death paid for my sin in full and that you raised him from the dead. And I will do my best to follow him and his example for the rest of my life. What just happened now? I don't know. Would you bow your heads and your hearts? Let me pray for you. Um, Father, I just, I just thank you uh, for recording this event for us. Uh, for helping us uh, record, understand that this event happened. Because it is almost too unbelievable to believe. But after thinking about it and after thinking about history and what's happened in history, it's clear to us that something happened and perhaps something really big happened. And the more we think about it, the more we realize that that something gives us hope today. Hope that, uh, that no matter what tomorrow brings, no matter what we go through in our life, whatever we experience, whatever we fail, whatever pain, whatever loss we experience, uh, we have hope because of this event that our future is set with you. Father, um, I just thank you for Jesus this morning. And I thank you for Easter. And I thank you for the resurrection. Amen.